this is where it's going to get fun. You are going to write a keyboard that does pig Latinizing. Baby steps. We'll get there. Okay. In Inky Keyboard Creator. Excuse me, is there people feeling a little bit more? I am. Right. Uh, you always been last. <laughs> <laughs> I was coming. I'm never I'm never one. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even do one. Uh, in your in keyboard creator, by now you should have um, signs to simple letters like we put ang on the end key. Um, we have assigned some things to two dead keys. We'll see what that looks like. Uh, one other thing we should experiment with here is assign a rota. There are a couple different kinds of rota, and in keyboard creator does one particular kind of those. And for what a rota is, as far as in key keyboard creator is concerned, it's a way of getting multiple keys, characters off the same key, by repeated taps on it. So just like with the mouse, you have a distinction between two single clicks and a double click on your keyboard. You can have a distinction between um, two single taps and a double tap. The, the speed of what you do that. And that's nothing new. Um, I, the mouse has been doing it. Cell phones do that in spell mode. So that's uh, what we're going to do that with is on the oh well I went and just assigned uh, my minus key to be a dead key. That's the key I wanted to use for my rota. Mm. Uh, but I'm going to instead it would be just a little bit funky, but I'm going to have zero make my if I click on it once, I want it to make a hyphen. Um, actually to show you what is going in here, let me type it. In here. Um, I want to activate the extended US keyboard because this already does what I want. And so this will be a way to get that same thing. I'm going to, um, with my extended US keyboard turned on, type in the Unicode string vector the characters that I want to appear in the sequence. So I'm pressing minus once and I get that hyphen minus. I press space. Now I'm going to double tap that and I get an end dash. Hit a space, I'm going to triple tap it. Oops, hit the wrong key. Triple tap it and I get an M dash. Uh, why don't you all do the same thing so that we're all on the same page there? Yeah. By the way, um, now while Unicode String Inspector has an alt x functionality to it, the um, extended US keyboard, the keyboard itself has that same functionality. Uh, and in fact, that'll even work for SMB characters. Um, so if you want to get a character, character 915 is a Demnagri cup. I can press Alt X, whichever program I'm using. So we can do this right in, um, in Keyboard Creator, and it will create that for me. Giving backspace undoes it. What, what is 915? What character? 915 is a Demnagri cup. How did you put that? I pressed Alt X after activating your extended US. After activating my extended US keyboard. Now, question: Can a Keyman keyboard do that kind of functionality? You type. So, if I type, taking a side note here: one E one uh, one B one one E Alt X gives me the SMP character for a treble clef. Could you do that with the Keyman keyboard? No. Absolutely not. Yes. Really? If it's big enough. <laughs> it's as big as Unicode, right? <laughs> yep. uh, I think you need a separate line for every character in Unicode. Um, I want a judge to see that. What's the number again? <laughs> that was 
1E, uh, you will have to have a font that can render SMB characters. Oh. What's a font? Uh, uh, I'm using. Font. What's the font? Just <laughs> kidding. I'm using Code 2001 as a font that covers a whole bunch of characters, including SMB characters. Um, so we probably won't be able to do that. Huh? We probably won't be able to do that. With what? We probably will not be able to make that character show up, right? If you don't have a font to show that character, then yeah. not in this. Actually, you could. Uh, because I think if you go to your browser, um, your browser can probably do that. So here we type, I turn on my extended US keyboard, and I type 1D11B, one, one, e, and I press Alt X. Oh, not there, I can't. Um, Sorry, uh, you're not going to get me on this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the but point is, functionality-wise, you can have a keyboard that can do whatever it needs to. So to turn something into, you know, digits into a character is, is um, programmatically. This, this, this can, I have wished for this um, functionality in programs that can't really do it. Like right now, you can press the old X in Word, and Paratex also does it, but say, Notepad or, or some other program that don't do it. You turn on the keyboard and press on that to the character. So that's where we're going with that. We go. we're, we're trying to slam King. <laughs> trying to answer. Doug had a question yeah. before. Actually, you weren't, you weren't here, but when I said no, he's like, no, Key Man can. He actually didn't bash it at all. Uh, it just take a bit. <laughs> Okay, a <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, so we just set up what we were, um, we wanted our uh, keyboard that we're making in Inky Keyboard Period to have the same kind of functionality that our extended US has for double tapping our minus to get an N dash and triple tapping it to get an M dash. Okay, so uh, everybody get text like that? We're going to just copy it from there um, and find where you would create it and put that in there. So that is what, um, and because I already used my hyphen for a dicky and I forgot I was going to do this, I'm putting this on the zero. So single tap on my zero key will produce a dash, double tap will produce an M dash, double tap will produce an M dash. How did you copy that? Oh, I just Copy I could have typed it directly in here, but I wanted you to see uh, the code points underneath. So now if you type a thousand in numeral, you're going to get a one and a... Yeah, well, this isn't a very practical keyboard. Okay. Anyways, this, this is a... Um, 
we're, we've assigned that to a zero key, which is kind of. You know, I have a question. Yeah. What's the difference between having three characters like A, B, C, and uh -huh. I push on my E and I get A, and then I push it again, and I get two times, I get B and three, versus pushing the key once and getting the string A, B, C? Okay. How, how do I know the difference between what this key is going to do? If I see three things there, how do There's I know a space between them. Remember, I'm on A space B A C. If I want this string of things to go on this. Uh, uh, okay, I can think Ben put yeah. something yeah. in there for um, suppressed row creation for this key. Only necessary to the set of characters includes a space. Wow. Okay. Thanks. So if there's no space, it assumes you want the whole string. Yeah. Just a space B C. Yeah. I said okay, put on A B C. Yeah. But if you put space in this, oh, you want me to do the row thing? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good question. Yeah. Watch out. Oh. Okay, so we have some regular just plain letters. We've got a rota key there. We've got some dead keys. We have the start of a keyboard. And so we are going to, from the file menu, I'm going to flip. I'm going to, oh, I might as well save the project. Um, and I'm going to call this Elonian. And then I am going to export as in the keyboard. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. I, w I went ahead and looked at the, the IPA wiki file. Can you do? Can you do like your your um, forget get everything key? Not here. Not there. Okay. That's that's uh, not the way that inkeys word creators uses roots. Yeah. Um, but we'll get it. It's it's easy to do otherwise. Inkey word creator just to yeah. give you a shot to start. Yeah. And if you got really basic, kind of keyboard. Okay, good question. So we need to put, if we're saving this, you're saving it in a default area, right? Uh, you're saving this, it's an IKP file, which is something that in keyboard creator is the only thing that reads. So that you can come back and edit it. Anywhere we want, not in roaming apps data. You can put it anywhere you want. Okay. Uh, when we export as an in keyboard, that's going to make an in key file that we will bring into the in Okay, and so from the file menu, now I'm going to say export as key keyboard. Okay, and it says, oh, I haven't set the keyboard settings. Mm -hmm. So please yeah. check to make sure that all the keyboard settings are correct, then hit the OK button to export. Here's our keyboard settings, this looks familiar. And this is where we say what in key is going to call this as. So uh, that means Elbonian. Menu text, I'm going to add an ampersand before the L. Uh, I think I'll assign some really convenient hotkey to this, like Windows, Control, uh, Shift, Alt, what else? Um, one of the principles I would suggest also, we did cover this principles of keyboard design avoid re finger combinations of things, please. Um, a lot of keyboards do that. Older keyboards that didn't have like the ability to distinguish between a multi-tap and a you know, two single taps or uh, sequence of things. Um, it is just ergonomically bad news to uh, require a user to be holding down three keys all at the same time. We're going to pick a locale for this. Uh, let's pick Albanian. Um, evidently that's a major enough one that they didn't require us to pick an alternate. That's enough. We can say, okay, now it's asking where we want to save this file. So we can just save it anywhere you like. Uh, just remember where it is that you're putting it. Because uh, you're going to need to go there and double click on it or go to the key and uh, update and bring it in there. Pending. Is everybody exported a new key file? Anybody not yet? Not yet. Oh yeah. Oh. oh. You had to pick a language when you did that? Yeah, just pick Albania. I didn't ask. Near the top. Okay. What was your hot key combination? <laughs> I did. Uh, does it matter? It doesn't matter. <coughs> Do you want to assign an icon now or no? No. It's not asking me a language. Uh, it, click on the box next to it. Oh. That 
the change will tell them. The same dialogue? No. Uh, as you are doing the export, this. Oh, the export. I mean, if you're exporting to it, you can do it. I keep scratching, I keep doing it. Uh, I had something similar like that happening and I had to restart. I can see. So you would, I restart like it, it gave up like an exception. Give you an application error. Yeah, yeah. Uh, recent, close it. Have you, did you do it once and now you're redoing it? I've done it twice now. Um, I would close IKC, delete the first one that you exported. Um, it seems it has an issue with it thinks there's that file you're trying to overwrite is in use. It does bad things. I, I will have to. It saves it fine. It saves the project fine. Okay. But then uh, I can't export it. Yeah, it's the export that that seems to have that issue. So I'll ask Ben Chenwin to uh, identify what's what's not. Uh, Actually, I try. I I set up the keyboard. I save it as uh -huh. a as a project. Uh -huh. And then the next time I try to save, it crashes. Or as a project or exporting? As sorry, a I tried to export it and it crashed. I recreated the keyboard, I did this and clicked OK and it crashed. And then when I try to open up that project, it, it crashes too. Okay, that's bad. That's okay. a sweet <laughs> Tigger makes everything that. Okay. okay. But do you have something that is exported? That you no, I can't it? export it. I, I save it and then nothing works after that. Okay. I can't open it up. Try Try starting completely fresh and um, don't even save it as an inky project. Just export it right away to a thing if you haven't used it before. Okay. Because uh, there, there is a problem there. Okay. Everybody else to the point? We can move on with that. Okay. So you've made your inky file. You can go and double click on that, that should install it, or you can from your Inky menu go to right click, configure Inky, on the add configure keyboards tab, and say install the keyboard, and then navigate to where that is, and open that. That will do our install. When you go through that, it Double click it and then install it that way, but it doesn't show up in my list. I have to press something to get it to reread it. Um, have you installed the key somewhere else on your system before? Yeah. It might be that that's the you should go through this way to get at it. Yeah. It might be that what I need to do is when you run it, it checks that anything that gets put in registry. I am now here. And now I was originally installed over there. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's it I gave B file? That is just saving your project in a way that you'll be able to edit again. Because the key keyboard creator doesn't edit an inky file. Yeah. It's a one way stream. And I'd like to see IKB turn into something that would you know go a bit further. Maybe work directly on the key keyboard and do it with IKP as a separate format. Okay. Um, uh, well. Uh, so once you are, once you have installed it, uh, if you brought it in from this way, you might want to check that it is actually enabled. Uh, I'm not sure that if the keyboard creator turns on enabling by default, but on that add configure, check that box is turned on. Uh, and uh, and then we're going to go and look at the file that has been installed. So that's back on the in key options page. That open button opens our key folder. Does everybody know what I'm talking about? 
skip that little bit of the button. And that takes us to our new key folder, and you should now have a folder there called Elvoni. That is your newly installed keyboard that you've been creating. Could you do that again? I missed how you get there. Okay. From the in key, I got to the configure in key by regular on the iPad. Choose the configure in key from the menu. And there's an open button that you see there. That's going okay. to take, take you right here in the key folder. <laughs> okay. Now, this Albonian folder that has been created for you, thanks to Ben Shemek, contains your files if you need it. Uh, there's an icon there, you can edit that with your favorite image editing software, to, but we're not going to do that right now. The main thing, um, the class INI file is going to go away fairly soon. Uh, there are some settings in that Elvonian thing, p.kbd.ini. Let's just look at that. And you see that what this is telling you is the settings that Inky knows about his keyboard. It tells command, so it shows you what the name of the AHK file is. Enabled equals zero says we are not. This keyboard is not going to show up in the list. I can change that to one if I wanted to. There's our layout name and new text that we specified the hotkey and the identifier for the locale. Uh, Albanian is 041C. And there's the name of our icon. So those are settings that we didn't have to do much about because they were just there. Where all the stuff that we did is, is inside this Albanian in AHK. So open that in your favorite editor. Okay, you are looking at uh, an auto hotkey script. This is your keyboard. Uh, so some of the things worth knowing off of that. Um, comments. You have comments that are block comments that start with a slash star and end with a star slash. Uh, you can have single line comments that begin with a semicolon. So all that stuff has no, it's just for documenting what's in the file, it makes no practical difference. You'll see some things near the top of the file. Uh, this minimum in key library version is something that says, this is the version I was using when I made the keyboard, so if somebody's running an older version than this, then don't, it's not going to work, so don't try. Uh, and we will address the other, this use context, does it include, does it put in there for you? Don't really worry about those right now. Uh, they're just there because they were supposed to be here. So we've got that top section, pretty much just let it be as Inky Keyboard Computer made it. Um, now, what you see down here, these are our key handlers. And so for the things that we set up, um, in key keyboard creator, put these things into the file. Um, all right. Okay. The main section. So you'll notice the syntax that AutoHockey uses for specifying a hockey. Everything here, you'll see it starts with a dollar sign that's followed by two columns. Don't ask why, just do it that way. Um, uh, you can read in the AutoHockey help file what all the, uh, the hotkeys are. So for shift K, that would be a plus K. And so a simple assignment to that key would be a command, like you see right here, like any finger. Thank you. So we have send, and then inside the double quotes we have a character for it to send. So do you have some characters like that in your keyboard that you made? Something where you could just assign one character or set of characters to a key? That's what you get. That's the simplest 
introduce the set function. Press, press a key. This is what it wants to, needs to send to the application. So right here we've got K will send a dot not cup. Shift K will send a cup. G will send a cup. Shift G cup. Okay. If you want to send a character referring to it by its code point, you can use this star <coughs> function. And uh, so you see here four ways of saying the same thing. Um, put it right in direct quotes. Use the char function with a number. You can specify numbers either in a decimal format or the way auto hack these attacks for hex number has a zero x on the front of it. So hex 915 is decimal 2325. Or you can have a string that uses this backslash x curly format to have some number in there. That could be an SFP size number two. Uh, that's the least efficient of them. Um, so generally, it would be something like that or not. Um, now, if, that's, if your keyboard was simply spinning up one character for key press and MSKLC, you would have done that just as well. But for the learning example, we use some dead keys. So you'll see of your dead keys that you set up, it will have um, assigned that key to a set dead key um, command. So when, for this one, when back to take this press, then do set dead key one, and when here is equals this press, you'll get set dead key two. Does everybody have something like that in their keyboard? Then we assigned things that happen. The, the logic behind it, um, and you could write things out this way in full. Boy, the red is not coming too well. Very well. It's kind of an if, else, if, else type of thing. If, it, if dead key is one, send that. Or if the dead key is two, send that one. Otherwise, send the plain key. OK? Um, but that just takes a lot of space. Auto key, if you're going to have something that is a multi-line and like this, and you start it after the thing, not on the same line, and it has an end with a return. So it's OK. Um, but that's a fairly complex syntax. It's much more compact syntax that lets us set out a series of alternate rules to process. So we join the parts of we join the parts with two ampersands, and we set out our alternate parts with two vertical bars. Or alternatively, we can use and and or for just other names for the same thing. And in fact, I think the format that Inky Keyboard created did for you with something like this. Yeah. Okay. So all of those mean the same thing. Um, the the really to explain a bit more why this means the same thing as this if else if else kind of construction. Um, this well for one thing this all comes like it's on one line with the and operations happen before the ors. So it's, it's sort of like this right here. These are group as ands, or this and this, or this last one. Um, and has a higher presence. Or, and then um, uh, the way it's working is what it's called short circuit logic. Uh, that's the idea that if you've got two expressions, a and b, um, that are each going to return a true or false value, a and B is only going to be true if they're both true. So it evaluates A first. If that's not true, then it's not going to evaluate B. So B is only evaluated if A is true. Okay. With an OR, that's going to be true if either one is true. So it'll evaluate the first thing. And then if that was uh, only if that is false, is it going to evaluate the second part? Okay. That I'm not sure if you have to totally understand that. 
um, you can just think of it as alternate rules are listed one on a line and each new line starts with an or. Uh, and then if you've got a condition like the is dead key, that's glued to the front of a command using an and. Uh, if you just kind of follow that kind of structure, that lets you set out your alternate things. Um, I had told you that um, if something has to um, be a single line command in order to start on the same line as the thing and not require a return. Um, this counts as single line because we have an operator oops, or being the first thing on the next line. So you can uh, break things up like this and that still counts as a single line uh, because you got the first thing on the line being an operator. Or. Okay. Does that make sense? Is that a question or a stretch? Switch. Okay. Okay. So basically, what you're saying, it'll, it'll just go as far as it needs to to figure out the answer, and then it'll stop. And then so it'll you don't stop. Have to worry. So you don't have to worry about what it'll do with the rest of the statement. Right, because if it's come up with something that matched, the send always is true. So if it hits, is dead key, and it was, and send, right. well, that's we're done. And that's why you can use and and or to basically mean the same thing as if and else. Yeah. So it's just a... A syntax we're using to get if then else kind of behavior. Now that the dead key, bear in mind, if some other key is pressed, that gets wiped out. The dead key number becomes zero. Okay. Now, fortunately, dead keys are not the only way to obtain additional characters. So my better approach is to use a post modifier key that transforms already typed text into something else. If you want to be looking at this document, this is what you found on the network server uh, as index dot something. Uh, something so a map, you got you know these pairs of things. This A should turn into that A, and say this one should turn into that one. This would turn into this. These are pairs of things that are related to each other, I try it. that when the key is pressed, you want to transform the one into the other, replace the first one with the second one. So in key, it describes those changes using a map. Okay, so compact means showing pairs of text segments, typically just characters, where one segment gets replaced with the other. Okay, so here's our map syntax. It's like this. We say map. And then in that, we just have inside double quotes each of these sets of things. We can more compactly because this maps to that and that maps to something else. We can put that all in the same series there. Or you could split them out, right? Either way. Okay. You could. Um, so the way you would get those arrows is using your extended US keyboard, using pressing Alt period. Um, or with your OSPI keyboard. Now, uh, somebody mentioned they didn't think they were getting the OSPI key keyboard. They didn't know what to look for when they were. Um, uh, what you're looking for when you use the OSPI keyboard is, is that. You should uh, if you do well. shift right. Right arrow to get put in the move thing and then get this. Anyways. Um, so when you're making a map, you would use these kinds of arrows, and that's what we can get. Okay. Now as far as autohack is concerned, a map itself is just a string that we specially formatted. And to use it, we have to pass it to this in case function, and then call that when the back to key is pressed. So the way we actually would, this is in your question about how would an I gate like, um, where you've got the equals key is turning everything something into something else. Okay, this is this is the way it would do it. 
this is saying back to back to keeper and this is A into that one. And it's mat and loop mat. Okay. Now um, we'll get to loop map in just a second. What first though, um, if you wanted those to loop back around, one way to do that is for each set that you want to loop, you put a looping arrow at the end of that. Okay, and that is what those arrows on your extended US keyboard. If all of the things in there you want them to loop, that's when you could use the loop map instead of map. Um, and so then what we have it would look like this. Back tick. He does this uh, in case it um, is the handler for a loop map that's going to loop from this A, that A to this A, because loop map come back to this one. Okay? So now there's two very different ways that maps get used. What we did in IKC for the dashes, that was something, uh, let me just open that up. Uh, it was more like this, where we've got um, one thing maps to the next thing, maps to the next thing, that is um, all made by the same key. So in this case, we've got N that is mapping what the Devon Agri Na to Devon Agri Na uh, to yet another kind of Na. Um, and then here we have the or syntax again, saying if that didn't apply, the alternative is just send the first of those. Okay? There's a shortcut instead of saying or send is if that's the first thing in the map, you can just put an arrow in the front of your map, and that is what you will see in front of you in the one that um, I can see made for you. You put an arrow in the front saying the default thing is the first thing in there. So you put the arrow anywhere. What's that? If you put the arrow anywhere, or would you need to actually change the order here with the arrow always in the front? If there is an arrow at the front, it means you're telling in key, um, if the rest of the stuff doesn't apply, put this guy out, this first guy out. Okay? So why why doesn't it apply? You well, press it four times, press it three times. Maybe, um, okay, it's saying, if that was not there, if that arrow was not there, it, it's saying, if you already have this, turn it into that. But you have to start that coming from somewhere. And if this key is the key that's supposed to put, make that, then this is how you tell it to do that. Up in our IP style way of doing things, a letter key make the A and the equals turn it into something else. Yeah. This is something where the key itself is making a series of things. Okay, you get the philosophical difference there. If the key itself is making the starting point and repeated key presses of that same key, okay, that is the kind of thing that um, would be like the, the scope for a multi-tap kind of thing. The, the problem with doing something exactly like this is if you want two of these guys in a row, you'd have to have some other way that interrupts the context, yeah. puts out a phase or something that we don't see, but that um, results in um, that um, not flowing to, to this. <laughs> so the way we get around that is what you see in your uh, in key one, uh, in the IKC one, it's got this triple arrow, and that means this is a multi-tap. So you have to tap fast to get from here to here. If you do double tap, you get there. If you do triple tap, you get there. Okay. If you pause, you get two of the same in a row. If you pause, if it's just a bit too slow, it's like with your mouse. You do click, click. Wait, two single clicks. So you have a double click. Okay. So that, and I don't believe Keyman has any way to detect timing, does it? No. How would you adjust that timing? That was one of the settings in Inky. Okay. The user can go and by default it's 400 milliseconds. Okay. And if you got somebody who's just can't make it 400 milliseconds, you give them some more time. The same thing with uh, your mouse, you can do that. Sure. sure. Uh, Okay, so, oh, IKC probably gave you a loop map here, and it doesn't, in my mind, make a lot of sense 
for that to be able to map them out. Tell me about that. Uh, because to do that would mean that you quadruples have to be back here, but you have to pass. Uh, on that loop map, uh, uh, if you continue tapping and you get through that loop five times, uh -huh. that's 15 backspaces that you have, right? That's a problem. That's that's where the idea of backspace as a single key undo uh, doesn't work so well. Okay. Um, so, yeah, you wouldn't want to go looping around and around and around. And then my my empty knees will sit there and they'll argue over a character, right? Okay. Okay. So they'll hold down that shift key and they'll hit it. Say no, it's this one. Then their friend will say no, no, it's this one. They'll lean over their friend and they'll hit it. The guy has never left left on the shift key, right? Okay. So to me, I anticipate them arguing about it, which one it is, deciding on it, looping through it two or three times because they missed it the first time or something like that. And then they try to delete it and they say, we can't delete it, look, backspace, and it doesn't delete, it's just It just keeps going, rewinding to it's where we're going. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I anticipate my MTD is doing that. That's so technically mishandling the keyboard, I know, but at the same time, yeah. is there no, a we, we, we need to, I think, put a limit on okay. how far that goes. But it's also something the keyboard designer could just decide not to do when you do maps. True. But if you didn't put it in the loop map and you put in the three keys, what's going to happen when you get to the end key and you press it again? You'll get it. Nothing or repeat the key? No, then it's as if uh, you hadn't done anything, so you're starting out fresh. So it would have another key after that? Yeah. Okay. Now, and one interesting side note uh, you'll notice in the IK keyboard, we've got H like characters, and this is one of them. And we've got Y like characters, and this is one of them. Puts in both sets. And if you type the equals key, you're going to cycle through each of those things. Right? So you go through the H keys, and pressing equals after this should get you that. But if you're going through the Y key, pressing equals after this should get you this. Um, and it, it just works, because that's what it should do. Um, if you had like a key map rule that said, you would, I have to say, well, after this, pressing equals gives what it is. And here we have, it, it depends. So that's kind of cool. Anything? Is that a case where you're talking about context that's different from a dead key? Where, where it knows how you got there? It knows how you got there, but not, that's just a feature of maps. Okay. Uh, that it knows if, if you've just been using this map and you've got your, you know, in this map, where it's going to pick up if you press something again is where you're at. So, all right. Um, so that is maps, and that's a that's a fairly simple way to get you know, something to change something else. Um, where you've got some exact thing that you know would be there, and uh, you've got uh, what you want to, to do there. Uh, sometimes, though, you need a bit more power than that, because what might be in the context could be a bunch of different shapes. Uh, maybe you've got uh, a denogony. You might set up your keyboard so that when you press involve V, uh, you'll get the dependent doll that hangs off a consonant if it's coming after a consonant. And if it's not after a consonant, then you should get the independent one that stands on its own. Okay, so you want to specify in the context of something coming after a consonant, then put out the um, dependent one by default. And otherwise, put out the independent one by default. <coughs> Maybe you've got a different back to well, let somebody in the right case that that's not right talk between them. But that that would probably get, you know, ninety-five percent of the time get the right character um, just to break the context. So what we have now is the ability to use a regular expression to identify your context. Does everybody does everybody use regular expressions? For anybody who is not not so sure what regular expressions are. Okay. Regular expressions are a way of describing a text pattern. Uh, so, uh, 
it's kind of a mature language for describing a text pattern. So one of the things you can do in a regular expression is specify a range of characters. So I could list out, well, I, one thing you can do is define a set of characters as square brackets with each of those characters inside. That means any of those characters come to this and match. Okay. And so I could have square brackets, A, B, C, D, E, all the way up to Z. Well, that takes quite a bit of space. A shorter way I could do that is specify a range, square brackets, A dash Z. And that means match any letter one time. In this case, it's a one time. Okay. So for Devanagari, all our consonants are in a nice row from ka to ha. So I've got square brackets, ka to ha, hyphen in between, showing this is a range. So then I can use that in my rule to say after something that matches this, any character in the range ka to ha. Oh, I used the syntax that I meant to. Um, yeah, that's fine. The syntax in, in case statement when we're using a regular expression has after clause and a then send clause. So after this, after consonant, then send the dependent form that hangs off it. Otherwise, send the independent form. For those unfamiliar with Dhamnagri, that's the whole consonant range. The yeah. cut into the ha, right? Right. That is in Unicode. Um, the code points are all in a row there, too bad. Um, so that, 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 it's actually slightly more complex than that. There could optionally be what's called a nukta, dot under, that could come after that. And we've got a different regex syntax for specifying what nukta and considered to be optional. Um, what I want you to look at right now is we've got two clauses here. There's this after, and there's this then send. And they're separated by a space. So, as far as the Arhatki language is concerned, all of that is giving it is giving the in case function a string. And we are taking advantage of the fact that the way you can concatenate two strings, because after is actually returning a string, this then send is returning a string that has kind of wrapped the stuff in a special format. Um, the way you can concatenate them, uh, you can do that just by putting them next to each other. There is a concatenation operator, dot, that has to have a space on both sides of it. So you could say it like this right here. After this first thing, space, dot, space, then send. And that is making one string out of the two parts. But that dot is optional. Okay? So, the only place you actually need that concatenate operator is if you are going to break it onto a new line. Then we, we set, uh, it counts as being on the same line if the operator is what comes out first, so that concatenation operator, then you need it. Otherwise, you can just stick them right next to each other uh, with, with just the space of the point. Okay? So that's the after this, then send that kind of uh, syntax. Is everybody with me on that? Regular expressions. Nathan, what was what was the quote you told me? Uh, some people think whenever they have a problem, the first thing they need to do is write a regular expression, and they have two problems. <laughs> so, um, regular expressions are extremely powerful, um, but you you want to be careful that uh, you you keep things straight in them. Okay. We've got the after that set that we used. Um, sometimes what we want to actually do, though, is change what was in the front part, in the context. So we're not just sending a different thing out based, based on what was in here. We're actually changing what was there based on the context. So for that, we have this uh, replace with pattern. So here we have, if we've got devnagri ka, that is followed by now this right here, we're saying we could have the letter ka that is followed by some modifier characters. Well, Unicode defines which characters are modifier characters. Every character in Unicode is assigned to a category. And uh, you can 
refer to those categories right here. So the way that a modified character is referred to, um, there's kind of subcategories too. Um, mod M means any modified character. There's, um, there's mark. M is for mark. Uh, you've got uh, different kinds of marks that you could um, use a second lowercase letter that defines like it's a spacing mark or a non-spacing mark. Um, you can identify letters um, or category L and there's subcategories of that whether they are um, lower uppercase bubble letters. Um, but Unicode gives you uh, these kinds of things that you can use as describing the property and in your regular expression we use a backslash P curly braces and the character class that we're, we're after. The other thing we're using in here, uh, there's a little star right here, and that is a regular question way of saying zero more occurrences up. So we're saying find cup followed by this thing here that is uh, going to be a character of the mark category. Um, zero more of that. So we could have zero of them, we could have uh, a few different things that could be a, a nukta character. And what we want to replace all that thing with is a different, the aspirated ka, ka and then dollar sign one here is a back reference referring back to what we captured. Okay, so um, we put parentheses around it so we could refer to it as the first group. You can have more than one groups in there and refer to those, re rearrange them differently. And when you do your pig Latin keyboard, uh, you'll probably need to refer to a couple groups of what you captured. Okay? So this says find find a ka, and if it's got some marks after it, replace it with aspirated ka with whatever we, marks we found. Does that make sense? Red X Y, that's okay. Um, those the regular expressions that we use in this are implicitly anchored to the end of context. You want, normally in regular expressions, if you want to anchor something, you would like to put a dollar sign at the end of your string. That's already handled for you, so don't go and add another one in. Okay? So now is our exercise. And I think we'll do it uh, all together. Um, let's make uh, in our Albonian keyword, um, a pig Latinizer key. So our rules for pig Latinizing a word, if the word begins with one of our consonants, move them to the end of the word, followed by A. Okay? Otherwise, if it begins with a vowel and has at least one consonant, just add way to the word. Okay? You think you can do this? Let's uh, kind of work on that. Um, I'll have one screen here. Um, so we want to assign this to, let's say, the equals key. What syntax am I going to use here? Dollar equals. Dollar equals. Colon, colon. Colon, colon. Okay. Now, uh, what was the first thing? If the word begins with one or more consonants, move them to the end of the word, followed by A. Uh, let's just talk about what the regular expression might look like. What kind of a, a find pattern do we have there? Bracket. I'll just start writing it out here, and we'll put it to the syntax afterwards. So you want like a square bracket or a bracket? Uh, ram bracket. Which round? Ram. Okay. And then square bracket, then you'd have to put in all your consonants. Okay, put in all our consonants. Is there a faster way to do that? Yeah. Uh, range? A range of things. Uh, except all our consonants in English right in a row. All right. John, come on. I used to do not vowel and not space. Not A, E, I, O, U, or space. Which is just perfect, but it's... That'll work for this. Going to write words, not worry about punctuation or anything. So he's saying there, you can have a character class that is negated 
by beginning with a carrot. Um, is that big enough? You can all see. Can you make it a little bit bigger? Zoom it up. Okay, so we can have define a consonant as something of the character class of things that are not A, E, I, O, U, or space. Okay, I like that. Plus, plus on the end of it. Okay, and a plus on the end of it because we need to have plus one, means one or more of the things that were just there. So one or more consonants. Okay. Uh, can we have the punctuation in there too? We could. Um, you don't have to. Um, let's just say we're in typing this word. You just for me typing the words. Don't worry about punctuation. It'll simplify. So that captures uh, a consonant. Uh, now, what do we want to capture after that? You have to store this in some sense, and so that you can put it back. Yes. And so, what are we using there to store? Or remember. Let's put those parentheses right here. Yeah. Are you seeing? Oh, I haven't been getting sweet out. Those are worth good sweet. <laughs> He's got like three unopened sweets here. No, it's just for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there we've got that. Followed by, we want to say um, after that, just whatever part of the word comes. And we'll capture that in another set of brackets. What would be a way to say um, whatever other parts of the word there are? Uh, followed by anything till the end of the the to the end of the context. Context. The problem is we only we don't want to back up to words that are way back there. We only want to work on the current word. So okay, the next space. So basically, yeah, anything that is not a space. Um, and the way we say that is backslash uppercase s, and we need one or more of those. So that gives us something to find. Okay, we're going to put that in quotes. <coughs> and we're going to put quotes. This is our place that with. And in here, we're going to build our replacement for it. What are we replacing? <coughs> Two, group two, group one, followed by A. Okay. And what's our syntax in in key for what we stick this in? Same. Okay. It goes inside and in case. In, in case. case is the kind of general purpose handler for our syntax strings. So If it was after uh, a word that started with a vowel, we want to just send way. Uh, so, do you remember our, this was the re first one was the replace with, on this other one, are we replacing what's already there? Or we're we descending something that's after it? What are we going to use for the second? Replace with or after then send? We're not replacing anything. We're not replacing anything. Right. So, that's going to give us after something, then send something else. We could do a replace, right? But it would be inefficient because we're just re yeah, replacing Yeah, we don't want to replace side. more than is necessary because we don't want to be backing up. OK? And so what we're going to say after. Uh, uh, or when you find this place. Okay. You have to, you have to find, find that it's a vowel. We're going to find that it's starting with a vowel. OK, so we've got. A, E, I, O, U, um, followed by a bunch of other stuff. Non space characters. Non space, at least one other non space character. Um, it shouldn't really be necessary. We could put in a backslash B there, which means match a word boundary, so that we're sure we're getting it all the way to the beginning of the word. Uh, but if the word began with the constant, the first rule would have got it already. 
Um, don't we need to? We need that for first one, though. Don't up here. Um, Doug, we are uh, making a big Latinizer key. Oh, cool. To turn <laughs> previously typed word into big Latin. He wanted that. <laughs> to that, yeah. We'll need that this afternoon, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we're saying um, when the equals key is pressed, it's going to be our big Latinizer key. Um, if it, our first option would be to replace a consonant, basically, a non-vowel, starting the word, uh, one, at least one of those, one or more, followed by a bunch of other stuff, with that part, followed by the first part, followed by A. And then we say, okay, that was for words beginning with consonant, for words beginning with a vowel, we've got that and that. We don't need to replace, so we're using, a, instead of replace with structure, we're using an after then send structure. Um, what would we say here? A, A, Y. Wait. I think it's the, uh, and then we could also say, or B, if there's nothing for the key to do. In the first line, you can take out the space if you should have to put in a word boundary. Um, Right. Okay, so we have made a change to our keyboard, um, and uh, if we had already been, if the keyboard was already loaded and in use, we want to have it reloaded, which was the Windows F12. So this keyboards have been reset. See that flash up real quick down there? Uh, and we will come here and make sure we see our Albonian. Uh, oh, I must not turn on. That's fine. Am I just not seeing it? Yeah, well, I didn't refresh there either. <laughs> well, that's strange. I did. To restart the whole thing. So you see, 
what that is doing right there. Uh, let's see. I think I have a keyboard that does this. So let me just demonstrate. I can type one, I'm pressing two, I'm pressing three, I'm pressing four, I'm pressing five. Okay? So it can output those characters. Now, what if we want to change the order so that whatever order you type them in, they will come out in order one, two, three, four, five. So when you press five, that five can always go on the end um, without reordering. When you press four, if there were any fives that were right in front of it, you want to stick it in front of those. So that's the only thing. Um, likewise, all the way down to if you press one, it gets to move, has to move in front of any other numbers that are in front of it. Okay? So we can do that with the red X replacement. Um, we show the pattern to replace and what to replace it with. And since that needs to refer back to the entire match pattern, we can use the back reference of dollar zero to refer to that whole thing. Okay? So if we the way we do that from what we had before, those first lines you see in yellow there. I think we can see the difference between yellow and white. Um, we've added the white. So still if you press five, there's nothing actually you need to do. If you press the one, if there were any two, threes, fours, or fives, so this is saying anything in that group, one or more of them, replace all of that with a one followed by all that stuff. So that's how we get a one to move in front of whatever was there. Okay? If they had pressed a two and there were threes, fours, fives in front of it, we want to grab all of those, stick them on the other side. That's the dollar zero referring to that whole thing with a two on the left of it. Okay? So. Um, so I'm going to type 3, I'm going to type 1, I'm going to type 5, I'm going to type 2, I'm going to type 4. And they come out in the order we want them to. Now, the last thing I typed was 4. So if I hit backspace, we don't want to take the 5 off the end, we want it to take the 4 out of the, where it went, right? And so hitting backspace is going to basically unwind. Because if these were diacritics, backspace, in the, the user's mind, I've just added that diacritic. I want to take that one off. If you put deleting the end character, that's not, that, that's going to surprise them. OK? Now, I'm not sure. Oh, I'm going to do it. Uh, don't worry if you don't totally follow this because it's kind of a rare type of thing. But what if you wanted your reordering to be dependent on the context? That's almost never the case, but Martin told me that sometimes it is. Um, that I think it for me it's in a certain context, <coughs> things need to be reordered one way compared to another. So let's say that in the context of digits coming after a B, then we want it to be backwards. So it needs to go in the order of 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay? So what that will require is just an extra rule for each of those digits. Um, so now you see what added in blue here. Well, that blue kind of looks like the white. The top line that we've inserted into each is what comes out to be able to take a case of when there was a B out in front of everything. So if there was a B out in front of a bunch of digits that were before this, there's a star there saying uh, they were optional. Then uh, send the one uh, right now, because one is always going to be the last thing in the string if it's coming after B. Whereas going to the other end of this, for a five, if it's coming after a B that may have just had five after it, then we want to replace any four, three, two, ones that came after all of that with the five followed by the stuff we found here. Now this is yet another structure than what we've used before. This is after, replace, with. And if you're familiar with regular expressions, you can think of this. This is uh, what's called a look behind. Okay, This is looking behind. This is not going to get replaced. This is just something we're referring to. So. This look behind often um, in a uh, flavor of regex, you cannot have um, variable width look behind. So you can't have like a, a star 
or a plus in your look behind expression, but here, uh, that's, that's okay. Pinky will be happy with that. Uh, but you can't use look behind syntax in, in your replace expression out here. It's got a separate clause for it to work. So after a B followed optionally by some fives, replace any 4321s with the five followed by the 4321s. Okay? And looking at what that would do then. So we've got, I'm going to type 3, 1, 5. Okay, it didn't come after a B, so that was the forwards order. Type B and type 3, 1, 5. It's reordering them accordingly because now it's using the first rule. The B was in the, the sequence things. So you can get pretty uniquely customized reordering using regular expressions as be one way uh, to capture that kind of stuff. Did that kind of make sense what regular expressions advice? Yep. Okay. I'm curious, um, can you use a fix with look behind in the replace clause or do you still need to use the, the after? Um, it's a fix with look behind. Can you do what? A look behind that's a, a fixed width look behind, like a typical regex engine can handle. Yeah. Then do you need to use an after, or could you just stick that in the replace? Oh. Um, I think you could stick that in the replace, actually, uh, using the standard syntax for look behind. Uh, that would mess anything up. Um, yeah. Okay, but if you want it variable width, then definitely want to use. Um, okay, and what what we get with regular expressions stuff that okay, um, in Devanagari, the structure of an orthographic syllable can be pretty complex. So let me just um, type. Okay, this is one orthographic syllable. And you can see it's made up of this consonant na, this joiner type of thingy, consonant ka, the joiner thingy, consonant sa. Now these two things join together and make this particular shape. Um, and then a vowel sign after that. Um, and to describe, you, you could basically, uh, I don't know how many things you could conceivably get stacked on there. Uh, you could get some other things in there, the nukta modifiers. Um, the possibilities for all of that are pretty hairy. Well, a regular expression can describe that uh, pretty decently. Uh, I mean, pretty readably even. Um, I'm not sure I'll try and make you read it. But the point is, um, there is a certain a character is ra written out here, and in handwriting order, that would typically be written the last thing. But phonemically, that's the first thing. That's this ra right here. Okay, and so when if you assign a key, like the sign shift r, that um, will produce that kind of ra at any point that you're building this syllable. Well, if you have a regular expression to define what a syllable looks like, all the permutations, it's got this front part and it's got uh, any number of these add-on parts and modifiers, uh, vowel on the end of that. Uh, at, at any point in that, if they press our shift R, it's going to look back over all that, recognize that much as a syllable, put our ra in front of all that. So there it is without it. Starting with the num, they press, and it can. But to try and do recognize, I don't know if Kima um, has a way to indicate, you know, optional repeated uh, constant, you know, add-on parts or something like that. You might just have to have a huge number of cases um, for all the possible. Oh, the permutations are just huge. But this irregular expression just lets you 
describe all those permutations very consistently. Yeah, and you could even tack on at the beginning that say that you don't already have a rod, so that it won't add a duplicate. Is that true? Um, you could just at the beginning of the reddit, and that way you wouldn't get them stacking up. Yeah. Nice. Um, so, yeah, because your regex could look and make sure. Um, there you'd probably be using a negative look in it, um, uh, which you could use right in the replace clause. Um, so, okay. So that's the kind of power that regular expressions buy us. Um, plus the ability to refer to characters by their Unicode category um, in the IPA keyboard. Um, we have all these, you know, underscore will turn into an underline kind of thing. And um, I like to be able to use the IPA keyboard generally, uh, you know, to type whatever. So if you're doing a phonology rule or something, you might want the underscore to be there. You don't want it coming out as a combining um, line below. Uh, but you can say, now, when this is pressed in the context of something that is in the Unicode category of letter, do that. Otherwise, put out an underscore character uh, referring to the Unicode category. Uh, you don't have to handle every possible thing that might have been taped there. That's, that's the power of regex. Okay. Oh, there's a quick view here on how complex it can be to describe a demagogy syllable. We say the consonant part is this. For readability, I, I just broke it up and use variables. Um, because that consonant part can come in there twice. This whole section here could come a whole bunch of times. Uh, but you can, whatever complex patterns are possible, you can describe it with the regex and then just plug it into our replace, just like that. Okay, now sometimes you have a situation where neither a regex or a map is sufficient in its own to compactly describe what you need. Um, I saw um, a pretty amazing keyboard that Andy Kellogg in Nigeria put together where he had, first of all, there's kind of functionality going on where he had um, a map of vowels changing from one to another. So he'd have a modifier key that would turn this A to that A to that, and this E into that. Okay, But then he wanted that to work even if uh, a nasalization was on there, or if a tone mark, one of several different tone marks was on there. So he had kind of some complex looping things that would pull off each modifier and then uh, get back to the vowel, make the change, and then add each of those things back on. And it was ingenious, but boy, was it hard to read. Um, so what we can do instead with the new syntax is something where we're combining a replace with functionality with a map kind of functionality. And so the syntax says replace something with the replacement using a map. Let me specify a map. Within our um, replace expression then, we have this dollar sign f showing the find part out of the map. And in our replace, we've got our dollar sign r referring to our um, replace part out of the map. So what this would do, it would find the vowel right here, followed by optional modifiers, and replace that with the replace part by, and then followed by those same modifiers. So dollar sign one refers back to this group of zero or more things of Unicode category M. That's really cool. And yeah, the, the amount of code that it required went from the screen tools down to a very compact syntax. Um, so that is that is the structure for replace with using that. Any questions on that? Okay. Uh, 
this on-screen keyboard business is, is just, you know, a very um, raw thing. I, I just upped in the other thing. Um, but if you're curious in the syntax for how to put those on, um, basically, uh, in that on load script section of your script, if you look in the extended US um, keyboard, this is what you see, where you're building your GUI, um, giving it buttons. There's other um, elements that you could add. Um, this is somewhat tied to AutoHotKey syntax that you need to look in AutoHotKey help file for um, what syntax for building graphical elements is. Um, that you could, you could have, you, sometimes an on-screen GUI that is laid out like a keyboard could be a good thing. Other times it might be the best presentation of it would be something like for IPA. Um, it wouldn't necessarily make sense to have uh, something laid out in a keyboard layout because there's so many key combination things that go on. Um, you know, show for the equals key. Um, it's just all these things that it does. Um, sometimes you want to do that in terms of, uh, so for IPA, you might want to multi-tab kind of thing that you can click on your consonants tab, files tab, or supercementals, whatever. Um, that might be a better way to uh, to do those. Uh, but I haven't built one yet for IPA. Um, but if people are interested in playing with that, um, I'd be interested in talking to you. So, um, so by putting those kinds of stick, what the button command there does, um, it takes four parameters. The first one is what text to put on the button. Then is what tip to pop up if you hover over it. And the next has to do with the size of the button and position. Um, but since we didn't specify position by fault, they're going to go one right under the next. And then using the same kind of syntax that goes in the in case, we can say what action to do when that happens. And we could actually have a series of uh, case commands that we uh, put inside uh, a cases. Uh, cases is something then you can put multiple case commands separated by commas. And yeah, that is basically what uh, we're we're looking at stuff for the for on screen. A um, couple other things to point out as we wrap up. Notes on auto hotkey syntax. Uh, comma is also an operator. So if we were using an app like this, but we wanted to be able to put more comments in it, we can break the line if the comma is what comes out front, and then your comments can follow um, interspersed. Um, also, sometimes you'll find the keyboards that um, using the ternary operator that uh, key has, you've got some condition, question mark, whether the true colon results that's false. Um, so, you know, when instead of using the or way of structuring things, we could do it like this, send, so is the key is evaluated if that's true, send the uh, full form, otherwise send the dependent form. In that uh, HTML file, you'll also see, uh, so here is like the more of reference, uh, the possible things. Each of those things, actually, we didn't use this else send because it's always optional. You could always just, after your case, have another line that's or and a send. Uh, so it's really not needed. But for efficiency, it's more efficient to use those. But for learning, I think uh, I wouldn't worry too much about those. Uh, so you can read through that uh, when you're having trouble sleeping. Um, we have eight minutes. Uh, questions, comments? Great job. Good work. Yeah. Thank you. If you were curious, we could take a peek inside like the IPA keyboard and just look at 
the elements that we have uh, have to make sense of debug view that that small tool that you ah have. debug view. This is something that is um, taking output as you're as you're doing things. You could have that. Well, I don't have enough pixels on my screen right now to do much with it. Um, but uh, set it to be always on top. But then. As I type, you're seeing activity over there. Uh, you see the context that's being built up. Uh, if I'm moving from one window to another, you see what is um, happening internally. That, uh, if you saying, oh, I need to go and change to that language now. Um, and sometimes if something is not working on your keyboard, and you look in there, you'll see, oh, it's warning me that I'm using a variable I haven't initialized. Like so the context there you know, gets updated as you are. Um, so yeah, if that's open, that will give you a kind of an insight view on it what is going through in key's head. The IPA keyboard. Uh, uh, it is actually pretty complicated keyboard. Um, here is that equals key. Um, I just saw this one line, so I'm glad I didn't see it wrap like that. <laughs> but it scared me off. It's just showing all the things that map and um, I think all but the first set loops are so use the map. Um, but all the forms and things go through. Um, so there's our different operator keys. The right wedge have, makes those transformations. Um, one interesting thing. Um, what? What if you wanted to produce an arrow, and yet arrow is one of our special keys in the map? Uh, and in fact, if you take equals key and then type right wedge in the IP keyboard is supposed to produce an error. Well, that's what this is dealing with right here. It says the equals key goes to and we give the uh, code point in, it in this format so that it's not interpreted to be our arrow, yeah, our, our mapping error. Um, Sometimes, especially if those characters in there are um, like diacritics, it is more readable to put them not as literal text, but as these escape sequences. Uh, so here's here's a case where um, our left curly bracket uh, it would make all these different diacritics uh, change one into the next and the next. Uh, or uh, if it came after a letter, followed optionally by marks, then it would send the first of those that 32A is the first in that series. Okay, but if it came after something else, if it came after punctuation, space, symbols, then we don't want it to start sending all these diacritics out there. So that's when we were just, that's when, what we really mean is the curly print. Yeah, um, I'm just curious on a uh, deployment level where you want to get keywords created, okay, you have a training issue, okay, because uh, obviously people need to learn how to uh, write the keyboards in this. And um, number one, I have to say that the, the level of um, coding involved is going to scare off a lot of people. I don't know how many people in this room would feel com confident working in the code here. 
if you want to ask to uh, see a show. Yeah, I, I'd be curious. Who would, would be comfortable uh, working on a keyboard? Or if um, is this not comfortable, but I would like to learn. Yeah, yeah it would take some learning. Right? Like to learn? Yes. Okay. Comfortable? No. Documentation is <laughs> on the way. Right. So, um, which I haven't uploaded what's on the network drive to the server yet. Okay, which brings me back to um, in the beginning, you showed us that thing where you could turn features on and off. Uh -huh. I don't know if I stepped out and you covered that, or if you haven't covered that, the, um, how to turn how to uh, create code for okay. that. Because to me, if this is going to succeed in being able to get a lot of keyboards out there used, it's going to have to have a couple wizard programmers who are doing the programming. Because I don't really see there being very many people who are going to tackle this. Okay, um, But then to build in more features that can be turned off and on, so that you could have somebody come up with a keyboard that works for a whole region, and people can use that supplemental area to turn things on and off. Um, so I'm just curious about that aspect of it and um, what the potential there is for that. I think basically um, for making a very complex keyboard with the types of functionality we've been looking at here, um, that is a programmer's job. Uh, for a simple keyboard, um, pretty much anybody can use IKC and get something started. Um, and how many people have used IKC in previous versions that more or less got them what they needed? Um, so if, if needs are simple, it doesn't take much. Um, you know, any program really. Um, so I think it depends on how complex of a, a keyboard you want. But I would say for a complex keyboard, it's going to take somebody who um, is comfortable with programming, especially if you want to get into supporting different options. So you've got eight different options, like a different keyboard. Um, um, then it's going to take a programmer type to set that up. But then the, it's at a user level. Um, to be able to um, turn options on and off. Yeah, it's just looking at the number of languages that are out there, um, that's potentially the amount of keyboards we might need. Um, there's, we have that army of people uh, programming keyboards. Okay, I think, I think one of the huge differences is the difference between Africa and India. We're basically in India, we have nine scripts that covers all 400 languages, plus or minus a few exceptions. So we don't have a separate keyboard for every language, we have a separate keyboard for every script. We Whereas might have two versions of a Devnagri, say between uh, a Dravidian a language right. using keys, characters. So we're talking a finite number of keyboards, yeah. infinite number of languages, whereas other parts of the world, each keyboard is customized more than that language. That's well, no, even in Africa, they tend not to be. They tend to, I mean, just from a, um, a, a management standpoint, okay, they try to have keyboards that work for an entire country. Um, but often it requires a lot of convoluted uh, fingering, and so people aren't very happy with it. So we're still looking to, to, to have easier solutions for creating keyboards. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Does, does this new system use the same customizing thing where it's just a plain text file where you can add things and change mapping? Uh, you could, but I haven't got into that kind of thing. Um, I think that's the level that most people want to customize it just for Moving some keys around. Right. But even if it's a case of um, they've got basically uh, Reminders, lunch times. They've got the ability to just change which these map to these. That's that's even at a user level. Uh, the most requests for, you know, I want things to be in a different order. So that's one kind of customizing a user could make their own custom keyboard just by tweaking 
saying, oh, I want to move that to this and this and that. Fine. Um, and it doesn't take building in options. Um, as opposed to the ROM that says, basically functions like a preprocessor type of level saying, uh, if this is the option, this is the command. Otherwise, this is the command. Uh, OK. We go to lunch. We can go to lunch. Um, thank you all. Great job. Thanks.